fear through Killarney. Now I'm back to hitching with the wind. But if Mickey Flynn should ever find me, I'll throw me caution all behind me and swear I'll fall on that son of a bitch again. He cracked open a rib or two, he beat me suddenly through and through. And so she over my unconscious frame. Dumb and lame. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Chase and the Pendant Podcast, a landmark episode, the first ever episode of the Chase and the Pendant Podcast, in which the Phillies have a record over 500. They finally break the 500 curse, moving the 16 and 15 on the season with a six nothing win over the Washington Nationals tonight. I'm your host, Rob, joined tonight by Andrew. Andrew, how you doing? I'm doing very well. Feels good to be able to breathe again after that Flyers game, but uh, they got the job done. And as you mentioned, the Phillies are over 500, so it's a wonderful night and uh, ready to talk about it. Yeah, these uh, these wonderful nights are kind of few and far between lately, so it's, it's a nice little change of pace <laughs> to be feeling good for once. I am also joined by Bork. Bork, how you doing? Good, good. I wouldn't have been good if the Flyers lost, so it wouldn't have been a peaceful <laughs> podcast for our listeners. Uh, but, um, no, I'm doing good because the Phillies won and the Flyers won, and so everything's going well tonight. It couldn't be better tonight. Hopefully that continues uh, Thursday. Yeah, yeah. would be nice if it does. I'm just happy that the Flyers got their game, their game done in time for our 10.30 p.m. Uh, recording session here because that would have been – uh, not so great having to record a Phillies podcast in the middle of a very stressful Flyers overtime period. So thank you, Scott Lawton, for getting that deflection and making sure that didn't happen and making sure we got a game six on Thursday. I literally said that. I was like, I was like, come on, somebody score before I have to do this podcast. I'm not trying to watch you assholes. In the back, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so thank God that happened. And more importantly for this podcast, the Philadelphia Phillies pulling off an easy six to nothing win, eight shutout innings for Aaron Nola. You guys alluded to in the group chat that he can never seem to pull off that complete game, no matter what it is. I mean, he was uh, he was excellent tonight, and Andrew McCutcheon with an absolute bomb of a home run. Alec Boom with a home run, his first ever Citizens Bank Park home run. Phillies winners of seven of their last eight. This team. As we said, finally over the 500 mark for the first time all season. And they finally look like they're starting to get going a little bit. And, Bork, I'll start with you. What's your takeaway from this recent uh, winning stretch that the Phillies have gone on? And do you think that's sustainable? Yeah, well, I think Jim Salisbury touched on it. But the one thing of tonight's game I did have the sound on for was Cutch's home run, which was hilarious because uh, Crux said, don't miss it, Andrew. And then he freaking smacked one, and he's like, oh, you didn't miss that one. Um, he gave he it a slammed. good stare, too. Yeah. So uh, that was kind of just a John Crook uh, speaking it into existence type thing. Um, but I think it's Kutch uh, who hit that bomb tonight, has been getting the top of the lineup going. Reese has been getting the top of the lineup going. Like we said on past podcasts, if the top of your lineup's going, usually everybody follows suit. So the top two guys – have been really swinging the bat well. And believe it or not, the rest of our lineup has picked up JT and Bryce because JT and Bryce haven't been as good lately as they were overall. Now, JT did get an RBI single tonight, so hopefully that'll lock him back into where he was before. But it's it's uh, really nice to see the Phillies offense average. I think it's like 5.6 runs or whatever it is. It's third in the league. So uh, to average that with guys that are stars starting to – have a little bit off games because that means everyone's able to pick them up. Uh, the only Achilles heel obviously going forward is if the bullpen can get more consistent. It's been better, but more consistent. So other than that, they've been hitting well and everybody's been picking each other up. Sean's favorite player, Andrew Knapp has continued to do good as a backup catcher. And, um, my favorite player, Goslin's continued to do solid. And then Kingery's of course on the IL now. So we don't have to talk about him. Um, but the uh, team just looks a lot better. Segura finally looks like he's playing like Gene Segura for once in his life again on this team. So that's nice to see. Uh, so 
I think it's just everything's kind of coming into place. And like Jim Salisbury said in the pregame, why can't this game or why can't this team rally off a bunch of more games if they keep playing like this? Uh, as long as you keep scoring above five runs a game, you probably should have a good chance of winning. So, yeah, I've got a little stat for you that's gonna gonna really surprise some people. After a two for four performance at the plate tonight, remember when Reese Hoskins was hitting like one hundred? He's got yeah. the average back up to two sixty nine <laughs> right now. Yeah, it's, it's insane what he's been doing. It. Yeah, get that average back up to 260. And also McCutcheon, who was uh, struggling pretty heavily to start off. Only one for four tonight, but it was a three-run bomb. He's got that average to 270. So, yeah, those guys have really, really come along. And as you alluded to, Borg, they they have picked up the slack for uh, – Bryce has been slacking off, although he did get a base hit tonight. He's one for two with a walk tonight. Or – um. Yes, uh, one for two with three walks tonight. And, yeah, he's he's kind of been slacking off. Hopefully he can get going again. Real Muto, hopefully he can get going again. But those two guys, Hoskins and McCutcheon, have been – they've been huge. And Didi's come through with some big hits. Roman Quinn even has had a couple big hits. So you see the depth in the lineup kind of showing through with the – with those two key parts struggling, and yet they're still managing to score so many runs. Uh, Andrew, what's your takeaway from this? Do you think this is is uh, sustainable, this little 7 out of 8 that they've got going here? I think absolutely from the offense and uh, Nola and Wheeler. I think they'll continue it. I think obviously the, the continued question is how much can the bullpen continue to man down the games and keep having the Phillies win. But I, I think uh, what brings it here, or what's helped spark this as well is I mean, I know we all want to see Kingery kind of turn it around, but ever since Alec Bohm's kind of got called up, you saw Segura kind of turn it around when he got moved to second, and uh, now that Alec Bohm's manning third. I mean, I like Kingery, but with him out of the lineup, it's just the lineup's been on fire lately. You have Alec Bohm continuing to hit. He's got five doubles in only 16 games. He's already at nine RBIs as well, and he's hitting 291. So I think that's been a big spark at the bottom of the lineup as well, with obviously McCutcheon and Hoskins turning it around at the top. So I think now you just got produ- production from all over, and you're just seeing multiple different things. And you saw tonight kind of uh, the offense struggled a little bit until the fourth or fifth inning, I believe, and then who sparked it? Alec Bohm sparked it with a home run in the bottom half of that inning, and then they obviously got going and ended up putting up five more runs in the game to get to six. So I think it's a uh, this offense is fun to watch. It, it's probably the best offense we've had in a very long time. And I know we said it all last year, but just imagine if we can get this whole lineup together at once, because as Bork mentioned, they're picking up for Harper and Real Muto right now. I mean, I feel like just a week ago, our last t- one of the last times we were on here, I feel like Harper was batting like 330, and he's down to 289 already. So I think that just kind of shows with how much he's struggling and everything. But uh, And then also, if you would have told me last week that we'd be doing this one, and McCutcheon and Hoskins have a higher batting average than JT or Lamuto, uh at the end of today's game, like I would have thought everybody was crazy. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it also goes to show that through 31 games, it's still a relatively small sample size, and the batting the batting averages can fluctuate a little bit more violently than they would, say, at the, the midway point of a normal season. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's I don't think anybody saw that coming uh, early on in the season, that those two guys would be hitting better than JT is. So that's, that's really something. I just wanted to say, one thing about Scott Kingery, though, despite the fact that he struggled so much throughout the course of the season, the timing of the injury really is unfortunate because I thought that that walk off home run that he hit the other night would have been something that could have gotten him going and kind of, you know, gotten him out of his funk. And then, you know, a few days later, he's on the IL. So hopefully he's able to bounce back from that and hopefully he's able to continue to improve his game once he comes back. But He's also going to have to find a way to win back playing time from Alec Boom. As you guys mentioned, he's played so well. He's been everything that we could have asked for ever since he came up and another home run tonight. So it's uh, it's, it's really good to see Alec Boom swing the bat that he way, the, the way that he is. Yeah, uh, yeah. I was going to say uh, with Kutch, we have to remember he came off of ACL surgery. So it's going to take about a month usually for you to get your full feeling and feel for everything back and that's kind of what we saw he got going a little bit at the end of last month and then now into the beginning of September so that should probably continue for him since we know how good of a baseball player he is it's just nobody comes back right away unless if you're Adrian Peterson from ACL surgery (laughs) 
Man, I wish this Philly fan base had cut Carson Wentz the same amount of slack for the same injury. <laughs> <laughs> right? Or Carson. Yeah, yeah, actually, that's a good point. Or Carson. Carson came back fairly. He played decent in the first couple of games back. That's a good point. <laughs> anyway, the Phillies, not only have they been winning, but they're also doing a little bit of dealing and trying to improve that eyesore of a bullpen that they had to begin the season. They've made some moves to kind of add some depth there, picked up a couple guys from Boston before the deadline in Brandon Workman and Heath Embry. And then yesterday they went out and they made a big deal to acquire David Phelps, a really nice right-handed arm out of the bullpen from the Milwaukee Brewers. And Andrew, we'll start with you this time. What do you make of these deals to shore up the bullpen? And do you think that they could have a big impact? Absolutely. I think um, it was much needed uh, for this team to do. I mean, obviously, we've got a lot. We haven't seen uh, the newest acquisition in David Phelps yet, which I think is the best one out of all of them. Uh, out of the th- other three or four guys we got, I just think the situation here was the team was that desperate for it. I mean, we all saw what we had to watch in the first uh, first half of the season before before these moves were made. And, I mean, I saw a stat today or last night it was, I forget, but the Phillies started the season with 11 guys uh, in this bullpen. And now that now that Adam Morgan's on the IL, uh, unfortunately, which came out this morning, there's currently two guys on the active roster that started the started opening day with this bullpen. So that's nine guys that they've turned over already um, just in a half a season. I think the Phelps move is going to turn out great. They didn't give up too much, it seems like, for him yet. Obviously, we don't know. Um, I don't think we've saw the names yet on the players to be named later, but they're expected to be low-level guys. Workman's kind of scared me a lot. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but his curveball just sits there waiting for players to find a way to hit. I mean, it's it just hangs there. <laughs> I mean, he's just he's just asking for it to get hit. So he hit. He scares me. Hembray, I've been a, I've been I liked for the most part so far. He obviously had a shaky couple outings and then I'm not huge on David Hale. I don't think I think that was just a, another desperation move. But but again, it's something we needed and it's definitely a lot better than it was uh, a week ago. So I think it's going to be huge down the stretch and it's something Girardi can somewhat count on compared to what a week ago what maybe uh, you couldn't count really on anybody. Yeah, and um They've they made some more moves. Uh, another one that I think could be fairly important that is being overlooked is Ranger Suarez is finally back. Yes, yes. Um, it, it comes at a good time right as they're losing Adam Morgan, so that's that's good timing there to get that left-handed reliever in Ranger Suarez. Especially because JoJo's pitching like a tank as well. Oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he <laughs> is. <laughs> he is. He had a real nice inning last night, and uh, another guy who we thought would be a Philly forever, but they finally let him go because they could finally afford to. Austin Davis finally <laughs> ran out of lives as a Philadelphia Phillies relief pitcher. He was traded to the Pirates back on the 26th of August for another PTB and Allen Cash, which, I mean, you can't possibly be worse than him. So the Phillies automatically won that trade right there. Uh, but, Bork, how do you feel about these trades? Do you think that these relievers are going to have any sort of a big impact in terms of the Phillies making a playoff push? Yeah, well, Phelps would, because Phelps has had since 2016. I read this stat when I was on MLB Network. I can't remember the exact numbers, but the be- one of the best whips in baseball since 2016, one of the best strikeout rates, and one of the best walk rates. So you can't really ask for much more there. Um, and this year he has a point uh, – Rob, you're going to love this. A .69 whip. Nice. Um, so <laughs> the uh, he's doing really good this year with a 2.77. He has a 2-3 and three record, but Milwaukee sucks. So uh, that, that that gives to why he has a 2-3 and three record. Obviously, those other numbers speak volume. Um, so he's uh, pitching really well. He's a guy he should close. I agree with your text, Andrew, even though he has eight saves. Uh, screw it. <laughs> like, like he should be closed and he's pitched very well uh brandon workman's doing exactly what you said which pisses me off because he didn't do it in boston at all and he's leaving his curveball like he's a 90 year old throwing a curveball up to the plate so uh he needs to fix that and get that going the way it was going last year otherwise he's going to keep getting whacked around the citizens bank um but I like Hembre. He just needs to settle in. I think he's one of those guys that's too goofy when he first comes somewhere. Like, he was kind of like that in Boston. He was, like, nuts. And then when he settles in, it's like, okay, cool. Now we have a good reliever. So I'm just kind of waiting for that settle-in game, and then I think we'll be good with him. 
Hale, I agree with you. It's kind of like you get what you get. Uh, he's probably an okay guy that'll give you two innings every now and again. Uh, somebody like that. Um, so I think Phelps is by far the best equi- or best um, addition along with Wayne Ranger Suarez, who just came back off of the IL. And then, as I said, Jojo Romero pitching that filthy changeup, you know, looking great out there. Uh, and he was our pitcher of the year, if I'm not mistaken, in 2018. It was one of these past few years JoJo was – he wasn't last year because he was abysmal in the minors, but, <laughs> but a couple years ago, <laughs> he was really good. Uh, and then he pitched really good uh, this year in the majors. So I could care less how he did in the minors if he keeps doing well this year in the majors. So that's a big addition. So I would say everybody will help us make a playoff push, especially David Phelps because Phillies might make him more money in the end of this contract because we have him next year too, I think, for an option. So um, – if they put him as their closer, well, that's going to help his value, too. So he's going to love that. Yeah, I'm trying to look it up right now to see if he actually did win a pitcher of the year in the minor leagues. Um, not finding anything on it. Actually, yeah. Um, I just found something on it. I'm trying to look up the year. Uh, the, 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 2017. 2017. That was the year. Okay, that yeah, was 2017, 2017 was the year that he was the pitcher of the year in the minor leagues, which kind of, let's be honest, it kind of speaks more to the Phillies' lack of minor league depth than anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just felt You're like wrong. <laughs> that, that's why I was like, I feel like I remember him being the pitcher of the year. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it did happen. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's good to see them making some moves and Clintech finally acknowledging that the bullpen is a faction of the baseball team that does a, indeed exist. I have a question about Glenn Tech, though. Do we think he actually acknowledged that or he got scared of Girardi? <laughs> I was <laughs> I'm going to go with the latter there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Girardi I, called him out after that Toronto, the two blow ups in Toronto or in Buffalo against Toronto. Um, and you know he's scared because those th- those first couple trades happened the day after Girardi called him out. Yeah. You know Girardi when he approaches you, he's got that you know the military <laughs> the crew cut going on. He's he's kind of got that drill sergeant look to him, so you don't want to piss him off too much because he he looks like the kind of guy he could just uh, unload on you if he wanted to. That is very true. <laughs> anyway, the Phillies uh, obviously were willing and dealing. Uh, other teams were as well, namely the San Diego Padres, who were probably the most active team at the deadline. And uh, Andrew, we'll start with you this time. Were there any other teams aside from the Phillies that, or I guess the Padres, that really stood out to you with the acquisitions that they made at the deadline to improve their chances of making a playoff run? Yeah, t- uh, two teams. I'd say one is an obvious playoff team in the Oakland A's. I thought their uh, d- their couple deals weren't like. They weren't getting top tier names, but they got two guys in Tommy Lastella and uh, Mike Meyer to really sure up that team and go on a playoff run. I thought they lacked a starter slash uh, more pitching depth, and they went out and got a guy in Mike Miner who they're going they're taking a little bit of a chance on. Obviously, he was a really good pitcher last year, has struggled a little bit this year, but I like them taking that chance on him and um, really going after it. And then getting a nice versatile player in Tommy Lastella kind of sure up that offense because a couple guys have been struggling on and off and they haven't had much consistency but they've still been finding ways to win so I really like that in Oakland that they were able to try and do that and then another one was Toronto actually again another team that won their surprise they're kind of like the Padres a little bit they're, they got all that young offensive power they've been a little surprising this year with how well they've done and put themselves in a real real race to get into the playoffs and everything so they weren't going to they weren't like the Padres and going all in but they went out and got a lot of different uh players that for sure veteran players that could try to help make a, a a small run or so or maybe just get hot and make a long run um and jonathan villar uh ross stripling uh te- not tenor arc they had him uh chuan walker and um uh, like on another pitcher robbie ray yeah robbie ray that they that they went out and got and i think that was big for him because they've lacked a couple areas here and there so i think I think those two, I really like them going all or not all going out and getting getting help in spots that they needed. And I always like seeing a couple teams make more than one acquisition there on that deadline day, and they did those things. Yeah, big acquisitions there indeed. Uh, Boric, what about you? Do you have any team that kind of stood out to you as having a very successful deadline day? Uh, well, Andrew kind of pegged all of the important ones. Um. I I would say I guess the Marlins. I didn't expect them to be the team to trade for Starling Marte, 
I mean, I don't think I pegged the Morelands to be, oh, yeah, you know what, guys? Uh, Storla Morte. It's like, oh, cool. Um, but I, I guess they could be one team that I was a little caught off guard just because of they kind of didn't know what they were going to be doing, but good for them, I guess. They want to try to win, good for uh, whatever. Um, another one would be uh, he's a player that's always great in the clubhouse, and we know in uh, – Colorado, how much they love having those guys that are energy guys that work well with their team, ergo Charlie Blackman. Uh, they brought in uh, Kevin Pillar, who is a guy that I always liked watching. He hasn't been hitting as well this year, but he's a good player and he's going to be in Coors. So you're probably going to see his hitting numbers go up in the second half. Uh, I liked that move because he's a guy that's a doubles machine and we know where doubles go in Coors Field. So that might turn <laughs> into homers. So that's uh that's why I like that move for him. I think he plays well to that stadium. Um, another one that I was surprised a couple people didn't get moved were Bauer, who I thought might because he's on the final year and the Reds have no idea what they're doing. Um, so I figured maybe that would be a case, but I think because of what I just said, the Reds have no idea what they're doing. Well, but I, didn't happen. <laughs> they, went, they went all in, too. No, they went in, too, on that winning, though. They got Archie Bradley and uh, Brian Goodwin. You're right, and I and I think that's going to bite them in the ass because they're not they're not playing as good as they should be. So unless if they pull their heads out of their asses and start playing better baseball, <laughs> they're not going to get <laughs> Well, it. see, that's the team that I actually was going to go with this having a successful deadline day because of those acquisitions because those are some positions that – we're underperforming. This is supposed to be a good Reds team this year. This is supposed to be a Reds team that, you know, probably finished over 500 and contended for a playoff spot and maybe would be in the conversation to make it kind of a deep run in the playoffs. And they had a lot of guys who were underperforming. And Archie Bradley, you know, their, their bullpen hasn't been great. Acquiring Archie Bradley is one of the – that fills a need for them. Uh, Brian Goodwin is a really underrated player. He's – you know, he's got a little bit of pop. He provides a lot of versatility. You know, he plays good defense. He's a good base runner. He doesn't do anything great, but he does a lot of things well. And that's that's something that could that the Reds could certainly work with. They could put him in different spots in the lineup. They could put him in different spots in the field, and he can help that team out in a variety of different ways. So those two acquisitions – if the Reds are going to make a playoff push, those those guys are going to be huge. So I like what Cincinnati was able to do uh, with their deadline acquisitions. I also forgot one. I was talking about the Rockies getting Kevin Pillar, and I forgot to mention they also got Michael Givens, who hasn't been as good recently for Baltimore, but I feel like that might be change of scenery, different pitching coach, because he has the stuff. Maybe that'll get him going. So I do like that really low risk move because it's he's not as so you're trying to see if you can get him going again for the Rockies because if he pans out they're one game under 500 uh, they have a good offense so if they can start pitching better they could go on a run just like the Phillies just did so yeah I thought they gave up a little they gave up a lot for Givens I thought but again you, I know you said the spot they need obviously and they're about to go on that playoff run so it's something you have to do but I thought Baltimore really got a good deal out of that one yeah, they gave up two, uh, according to CBS, they gave up two of their top 15 prospects in exchange for Givens, which is a high price to pay for a closer. You know, it's a high price to pay for a guy who in a full season will give you one innings work, you know, whatever, 50, 60 times at the most. So, um, yeah, it's, that's a hefty price to pay. Well, the Padres uh, traded Taylor Trammell for uh, Austin Nola, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so things happen <laughs> yeah that is true uh Bork, we'll start with you this time do you have a team that stood out as having a particularly bad deadline day huh um i don't know because this year's so freaking weird that you're like everybody really wasn't trying to so i mean one team i was surprised they didn't move people but then at the same time i guess i'm not because of their contracts uh was the giants because they have two pitchers that are on the final year of the deal. Um, and I was figuring maybe someone would say, hey, Johnny Quaid is in the final year of his deal, and he's you know, maybe any he pitch 41 innings. That's been great, but if you can get him going, uh, I was figuring maybe somebody would trade there, so I was a little surprised the Giants didn't move. And I understand they're 17-19, and 19, but how much of a chance 
do we give the Giants compared to the Rockies, who I just said winning seven of ten? I don't think that has as high of a percentage chance as Colorado. So that that's a team I was a little bit surprised. The D-backs going with that division. Uh, they traded Bradley and some guys. I thought they might have went a little bit deeper in their trade pool. Uh, but they made a lot of good moves, so I was okay with that. But uh, a team I was very surprised about was um, – because they always say they're going to trade people. Then they traded like Brett Phillips and not much else – um, Kansas City, I'm surprised didn't move other than Rosenthal and Phillips, Scott Barlow, who would have got them a lot because of years of control in terms of rebuild, of adding prospects. And uh, even Holland, because Holland's a veteran, he's pitching OK, and he's actually pitching pretty good this year. And he's a guy that would have been helpful for a contender. They're a team I was like, I agree with the two people they traded. They don't need Phillips anymore. And Rosenthal was getting for they were going to get to hope that happened. But it didn't make sense for me to stop there when your team is not going to be competitive next year and you want to still add to your pool. But it, it is what it is. I mean, they're figuring it out. They have Whit Murrayfield, who's a joy to watch. So at least you got him going for you. So. The best, <laughs> one of the best names in baseball, Whit Merrifield. I love that yeah. name. Absolutely. <laughs> a highly underrated player as well. And Soler. I forgot about Soler. I can't forget. Yeah, he came out of nowhere and set the team record and was – can you believe this? Last year, he was the first Royal ever to hit 40 homers in a season. Yeah, that's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, that, was hard, that was hard to believe. Yeah, I mean, man. Um, anyway, uh, Andrew, do you have any team that you think underperformed at this deadline? Yeah, and it's a team I'm thankful for underperforming, but I got to say the Atlanta Braves. Um, if, I, if I was an Atlanta fan, I, I'd be pretty mad right now. Uh, the day after the deadline, because obviously we all know the talent that they have around that roster, and they're in first place currently. And then we also know all the issues they have around that pitching staff. And there were plenty of uh, low-level names. Like I'm not saying you have to go out and get the Clevenger, the Lance Lynn, Lynn at the, of the Worlds out there, but like there was plenty of names they could have went out and got, and they could have stole Mike Miner from the A's. They could have got Danny Duffy, Robbie Ray, like any of those kind of guys to really help their team. Um, and they they basically did nothing. I know they went out and got what was it? Malone from the I think it was Baltimore or whatever, but mm-hmm. I mean he he's like he's like us getting Jason Vargas last year, and we all know how that how how much we were in uproar last year when we got Vargas. Yeah, well Malone um, came in and he only gave up seven runs and what two innings on Sunday night. <laughs> yeah. almost completely pissed away the ten nothing lead that is, that uh, Arietta gave them. Right, he, yeah. only, he only came in and uh, kept us in the game after getting a ten run second inning on from that offense. Uh. But yeah, it's just, I, I mean, for as a Phillies fan, I'm happy. But just from a baseball standpoint, I, I was really shocked to see Atlanta not make any moves on the actual deadline day. Um, Maybe they got bit by the season. Glenn Tack bug. Hey, found by me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not complaining. I'm just, I'm just saying what I was surprised about. So I, I'd say they were my biggest surprise, or because or, or, I don't want to call it a disappointment, but they were my biggest surprise of not making any moves. But that, there's a there's a handful of teams that go along with them because like I, I I was surprised in the Yankees when you have all those injuries and all those guys beat up I thought the Yankees were gonna go out and make a, a couple moves there to kind of try to solidify their playoff spot and make a run but uh, there was there was a good amount of teams that I was really I shocked if the that Yankees they literally just said this I can't control this this is just BS <laughs> this year's just nonsense I'm just gonna wait my hands to this and hope all goes well <laughs> I feel like that might be Boone behind closed doors Son of a bitch. and then he's okay screw it <laughs> like, he gets mad for five minutes and he's like screw it this ain't worth it <laughs> like, I, <agree>. <laughs> I, I will say one of the most confusing teams was the Marlins because when they did trade for Sterling Marte, I was like, okay, they're all they're all business right now. And you thought, okay, they're going in for it. And then they traded Jonathan Villar, and I was like, wait a minute. And Caleb that Smith. Doesn't, that doesn't make any Yeah, and Caleb Smith. And I was like, all right, this doesn't make any sense. I thought they were about to go all in for it. Well, I will say the Villar thing, I, I believe it has to do with the fact that Hassan Diaz has said that he actually is going to play this season. So they're just they're, they're assuming that he'll be capable enough of taking over that second base spot. Um, he is a, a solid young player. But it is questionable. They're giving away a proven veteran like Villar, who has, you know, played well through for various teams throughout the course of his career. So, yeah, a bit questionable. And also giving away, um, I think, one of the more underrated starting pitchers in baseball, Caleb Smith. So, like, what are you doing, Marlins? Are you buying or are you selling? 
especially, well, especially with how good struggled. with how good Sixto's looking. Like you could have had a solid top of the rotation there. Like you said, Smith one of the underrated guys still in the league. So like that would have been a nice rotation going forward, like in the next year. Well, it's yeah. typical Miami. They got to maintain right. the budget down there. Yeah. <laughs> well, they also had Eliza Hernandez when I saw the trade candidates when MLB Network. It was like pitchers to trade for Eliza Hernandez. I'm like, why the hell would the Marlins trade Eliza Hernandez? when they just traded for more people to compete. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, well, where, um, but with their team, they're taking a risk with Diaz because I like him as a prospect a lot. The problem is he didn't hit last year. When he came up, he hit for like a week, then hit for two more games, then just fielded well and ran the bases like a speed demon like he is. <laughs> so it's kind of <laughs> – you need to see uh, the consistent hitting from him that I, I obviously they believe in, so – uh, we'll see what happens there, but that might end up biting them in the ass because, like you said, Rob, Villar is a very good, just consistent veteran. So. Yeah, and another thing with Hassan Diaz is that a lot of, you know, the scouting reports kind of project him to be a Rugnet Odor type. He's going to hit like 200 but have that sneaky pop. So you need you need to have that 30 to 35 homers a year if you're going to be hitting 200. And if he's or not doing that. a bunch of bases. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. So for my team that I thought really underperformed at the deadline, I'm going to go with the Cleveland Indians. I have no idea what they're doing out there in Cleveland. They've got a team that's contending to win the the American League Central, a team that's talented enough to make a run in the playoffs, and yet they traded Mike Clevenger. They were trying to get rid of Plesak. Like, What's going on? You you have a great starting rotation. You're just gonna blow it up. Like, why why are you trying to rebuild? Why are you trying to sell when you've got a playoff team? That makes no sense to me. I think it was last year. The Indians are the Bruins. They're the Bruins of baseball. They will not deal with bull crap. If you're an ass off the field, you're gone. It's the same as the Bruins in hockey. If you're an ass off the ice, you're gone. Look how good Dougie Hamilton is. Look how good Tyler Sagan is. They're gone. Uh, Trevor Bauer, good pitcher, might win the Cy Young this year. Gone. (laughs) I think the Indians are just a team that goes, if you're an ass, you're not on our team. And Zach Plesak got lucky because they couldn't find a partner for him after they traded Clevenger, or they were going to go, we're moving one of you and hoping you get more mature to the other. And we'll see where that goes. That might have been the case as well. But either way, I think they're doing really what they said on MLB Network. They're the Indians where they have one of the best rotations in baseball. If any team could afford to trade an ace and still be like, hey, guys, you still have a three ERA all season. That would be the Indians because they don't make any sense. It's like you could pull some guy off the street and be like, hey, have you pitched recently? No, I haven't pitched in seven years. Oh, cool. You want to pitch for the Indians? And then her throw to like a four ERA somehow. Uh, and you'll be like, how the hell did that happen? Uh, it'll be like, like the movie Major League happening in yeah, real life. Yeah, it'll, be, it'll, be, it'll be like Major League happening in real life. Yeah, it'll be like, hey, there's a guy on the street corner that looks good at baseball. Um, but like, I don't understand like how they are consistently great doing that. But it's the it, that's why I compare them to the Bruins because I always get annoyed when I see oh great and well actually no I don't I hate the Bruins but I get annoyed at overall hockey like and as an overall hockey fan when I see them getting rid of good players but where with the Indians I don't detest their team they're actually a fun team to watch so it kind of annoys me when they get rid of good players because they're a fun team to watch in the West and it's like why but uh thank God they kept Zach Plesak I really like Zach Plesak and I think he's going to be a very good pitcher that continues to get better and if they don't keep Zach Plesak after this offseason and we still have Matt Glentak as our GM he better be calling the Indians about Zach Plesak <laughs> absolutely absolutely if anybody by by chance happened to uh, for whatever reason acquire a Dan Plesak jersey when he is pitching for the Phillies all you need to do is maybe um Maybe patch up the uh, the numbers and make the numbers match match whatever Zach Plesak's numbers will be. What number was Dan? Nineteen. Uh, I don't remember off the top remember. of my head. Yeah, that I was a long remember. time ago. That was a long <laughs> time ago. I don't know if I got that right. That would be ridiculous. Uh, but um, no, I was gonna say just tell him to wear the same number. Be like Zach. Do you like Dan's number? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Perfect. You're wearing it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have passed anybody having any type of jersey. Now I saw. I don't know if you guys saw this. 
I think it was Sunday night uh, at the Phillies game, the pandemic crew, somebody was rocking a Jason Vargas Phillies jersey. So, oh, my God, man. <laughs> Damn. I was like, the fact that somebody actually got a Vargas jersey was just hilarious. You sure that wasn't Matt Klantak in disguise? <laughs> I, I, maybe it could have been. The uh, the Brian Colangelo t- uh, Phillies, Phillies scandal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That would have, been, uh, would have been something else. Anyway, you guys got anything else you want to throw in here before we wrap the show up? I would just say uh, thanks to the Nationals. I feel like they kind of sparked this team when they put out that tweet last week. Um, yeah, seriously. Calling out, calling out. Uh, apparently, Phillies fans saying it was pretty tough to beat them or whatever. And now the Phillies are four and zero against the Nationals, and I think it's twenty five and eleven in the total runs. And then we're like you said at the beginning of the show. I think seven and eight, se- one seven of eight since that tweet. So uh, thanks to the Nationals for giving the Phillies the spark they needed. And meanwhile, they're out there pulling off the classic first to worst. Right. <laughs> Bork, you got anything you want to add? Um, mine is just, it's great to see Nolo continue to pitch great. It's great to see Weir continue to pitch great. And it's great to see Spence pitch a very solid, productive game, uh, last game and build on that. Cause obviously finally getting that done. Yeah. Yes. We banked on him cause we didn't trade for any starters either. So sure. we banked off of, uh, Howard being able to be our third guy. Cause it sure as hell ain't Jake Arrieta. Um, so we banked on Howard being able to be our third guy coming into the playoffs and then Eflin being your good productive innings eater fourth guy. So, uh, hopefully that continues and Jake Arrieta stops giving up 10 runs and then, uh, we'll be (laughs) solid. Uh, man, by the way, thank God for Reese Hoskins getting those couple insurance runs the other night. So Spencer Howard could semi comfortably sit there and dug out and watch at the end of his first career major league win because the bullpen seemed hell bent on taking that win away from him. And it, they ended up needing those two insurance runs because they ended up winning the game eight to six. So thank God for Reese for securing Spencer Howard's first career win. Yeah, that's true. That was a huge hit. All right. Well that will do it for this episode of the Chase and the Pennant podcast, once again, the first ever Chase and the Pennant podcast with the Phillies having a record over 500. We hope it's the first of many, uh, but for now, we'll be happy with the fact that it's the first one ever. And we thank you for listening to the show. And I just want to give a quick shout out to the Jack Dolls responsible for our intro and outro music. They are a great uh, Celtic rock band. You can find them online at www.thejackdolls.com and also on Patreon at patreon.com slash thejackdolls. Please give them your support. They're suffering through a tough time right now because of the lack of live shows they can do with the coronavirus going on. So whatever you can do, if you feel so obliged, uh, feel free to subscribe to their Patreon. A great Celtic rock band. Really love their music. I also want to give a shout out to Just Food. You can reach them by phone at 215-794-FOOD. That's 215-794-3663. They're located in Buckingham Green, Buckingham, Pennsylvania. Excellent selection of food. Their owner, Asian Rob, is a great friend of the podcast. If you happen to stop by, tell them that the Chase Independent Podcast saw you or sent you. Excuse me. Once again, great food there. Uh, location in Buckingham, Pennsylvania, off of York Road. It's called Buckingham Green. That is Just Food, 215-794-3663. We thank you again for this, listening to this episode of the Chase and Independent Podcast. We'll be back with another one shortly. Man, I used to be revered and feared through Killarney. Now I'm back to hitching with the wind. But if Mickey Flynn should ever fight me, I'll throw me call a shit all behind me and square off on that son of a bitch again. In a river too, he beat me suddenly through and through, and so she over my unconscious frame. I want me healthy, sheriff fights, well lucky son still have me life since Mickey Flynn beat me dumb and lame.